Very good. Thank you, Alyssa. So we're having some difficulties and fun, some entertainment with the uh, slides. Just, it just, yeah, that's life. <laughs> uh, some of them uh, need to be updated and so forth. That one's one. It's just too much on the screen. It gets confusing as to what it is. Uh, we're on page 35 in the book, The Walk. So if you have that handy, let's go there. And while you're getting located there, I'm going to get the screen share going here. Hopefully. There we go. And now the slideshow. All right. So page 35, we're talking about the subheading there, separated but not isolated. The title of this third chapter is helpful. It's called A Balanced Walk. And this evening's discussion is going to center on what we mean by that or what is the importance of balance in the Christian life. Here are a couple of statements. Some of them are kind of compilations of three or four statements that are made in the book, so you might not find it exactly quoted as I have it here, but it'll be close let me get something out of the way here, a little housekeeping. There we go. Um, the statement goes, as the world grows stronger and darker, Christians may share the good news that transcends every pleasure the world offers. We sell ourselves short, and unfortunately, we sell our Savior short by thinking we need all that the world has to offer in the way of entertainment. To think that we have to fill certain pleasure vacuums that are within our souls. What does that say about us? If we feel like we've got to drink at the same well that the world drinks at. If a born-again believer needs the same things that the world needs, then there's something that is fundamentally wrong with Christianity. Not as it is in reality, but as we practice it. And that's for each one of us to evaluate, to see where do we draw our sense of pleasure and satisfaction. It should be in eternal truth, not momentary truth that changes uh, every so often just simply because people realize that what they were chasing before doesn't fill the need and now they need something else. Wouldn't, isn't it interesting to go back and see some of the commercials from the 1970s and find out what we actually needed as a people back then? Now we can kind of laugh at it. But think of the perspective of God. As we run around here thinking we need this, that, and the other thing, when God says, I have all you need in Christ. Scriptures, one, one statement from the book of Colossians that just sticks with me. And you are complete in him. I honestly think if we captured the essence of that truth, it would straighten out a whole lot else in our, in our minds, in our lives as believers. Here is some uh, statement from 1 Peter 3. I thought the end of 14 needed to be brought into this as well, and I'll make some emphases. Have no fear of them, speaking people in the world that come demanding you to explain yourself as a believer. How do you get off believing this, that, or the other? You, you, have you felt like that any time recently? What do you mean there are only two genders? How archaic of you? What do you mean that women can't marry women and men can't marry dogs if they want to? I mean, it's getting to that point. And you'll be asked to give a reason for the hope that lies within you. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts, and I love the way this is translated, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Sanctify him in your heart is how you may be familiar with reading that. But honor him as holy. How do you do that? Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. The word behind respect is the word phobos, which actually is the word from which we get our word phobia, fear. 
a gentleness and an element of fear. Not fear of people, and that's why it's translated here in respect, because verse 14 ended with, have no fear of them. Do not fear the face of man, is a quote from the book of Proverbs. You see, we're not to fear people. We are to fear God. And we respond from a sense of readiness, being prepared, having prepared ourselves with truth, saturating our minds with truth, so that we're ready to give an answer from Scripture. And I've loved it when certain individuals from a Christian background, for instance, two I can just name right off the top, um, Dr. Bob Jones III and... Uh, um, John MacArthur, both of whom were interviewed by people like Larry King on Larry King Live and asked very pointed questions that challenged the validity of the faith that these men were presenting. And both of them responded, Larry, it doesn't matter what I think. That's not the answer to this question. The answer is what God says. I have another way that I express a similar thing to people normally today, and that is, you don't want my opinion. What you want is truth, and that's what you should demand everywhere in life. I want truth. Truth is not culturally relevant. Truth is truth. It is above culture. Truth is not subject to the whims of people, circumstances, or the calendar. Truth is truth. Truth is real. And that's what you want. And I had a discussion not too long ago with someone who was presenting some family issues and uh, people having different religious ideas and one family member going to a, the Catholic church, he said, I could never do that. I, I, I could never do that. And he was giving his explanation of that and I said, it really boils down to truth. What is truth? And if you are not content with man's answer and you are only content with God's answer from God's word, then that restricts necessarily where you go to church. Because if they don't speak the truth, then they have no reason for existence. It is just a social club. And honestly, that's a lot of what's fueling what's going on right now in Israel. Because the Muslims think they have truth. If their God tells them to behave the way they have behaved in this whole incursion into Israel, I don't want anything to do with that God. Amen? Amen. The unfortunate thing is that the people on the other side of that line, the people of Israel, don't really have a much better idea of who God is. Because they've rejected the Christ of prophecy. And so they're left with just a sliver of truth and a sliver of light is not enough. You need the entirety of it. Jesus Christ is the revelation of God in human flesh. You deny that. Scripture says you have denied God himself. And so what we're looking at again is a conflict between views of truth Views of who God is, and this world is full of that sort of thing. But notice here what we are supposed to be. We are supposed to be prepared messengers, ready to give a reason for the hope that is in us. What is that hope? The hope of forgiveness of sin, the hope of eternity with God. Yeah, it's based on Christ crucified and, rose, and risen from the dead. Without that, there is no hope. And then we respond, we interact with people in the world with gentleness and respect. You know, it is really simple to jump all over someone's frame and beat them down, much like Ben Shapiro does to his political opponents when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You could do that, 
But what's the problem with that? A, it's unbiblical. It doesn't follow the pattern of Christ. I'm sorry? It doesn't accomplish anything. It just makes you look intelligent or less than or stupid. Yeah. It's just a matter of what your perspective is on that, right? Um, but the whole point of the matter is we don't have the liberty to do that. It's not ours to do. To insult someone, you can't, you can't bring, bring someone into the kingdom of God by assaulting them with the cross of Christ. <laughs> it just doesn't work. And this verse tells us how we're, to do, how we're to go about it. We're to honor Christ as holy. How do you honor him as holy in the interactions of life? Being prepared to make a reasoned defense from Scripture. And secondly, being gentle, being respectful in how we present the message of truth. Yes? A lot of times that's the rhetorical answer. Right. But it leads, it escalates. Yes, yes. Um, the point is being made that sometimes the conversation will escalate. And I think back to a time in Puerto Rico when I was out visiting with our oldest son and we got into a conversation, I should say I did, with a gentleman, and he just got angry, irate, that I would have the gall to say what Scripture says and claim that this is the only truth that there is. How can you be so arrogant? How can you be so full of yourself? Isn't that? No, that's, excuse me, that's not the point. The point is, what does Scripture say? And as we walked away, I... Uh, said to my son, did you notice anything about that conversation, particularly about who was in control of their, themselves and who was not? And he says, well, yeah, he was out of control. I said, yes. I said, Do you know, did you notice how I handled that? He said, you seem to get quieter. Yes, because it forced him to close his mouth and listen. And it also was a testimony to everyone who was around, because we were probably within sight of a dozen homes in that little nook of our neighborhood. And I said, I wanted every one of those neighbors to understand who the angry person was and who the person was who was making a reasoned defense from Scripture. This gentleness and respect doesn't mean you back down and you knuckle under. It doesn't mean that you are the doormat in the conversation, and you let the person just tromp all over you. It's not my ego, though. That's what I have to remind myself of. It's not my ego. It doesn't even matter what that person thinks about who won or lost the argument. What matters is truth. So I keep insisting on truth. This is what the Bible says. And what I'd love to do in that kind of a situation is take a person to the text and say, would you please read this verse? Because it's not me just spitting it out, even though I could. It's them coming to understand this is what the Bible says. Well, that's what your version says. Bring yours out. I'm not afraid of that. You, you know you can lead someone to Christ from the Catholic Bible. There's some distortion there. You could lead someone to Christ from the New World Translation, which is the Jehovah's Witnesses perversion of Scripture. You could lead someone to the Bible from good news to modern man. None of those is a very good reflection or accurate translation or paraphrase in the case of good news. They're not extremely accurate, but there is so much truth in the Word of God that even when you try to distort it, you miss so much distortion because the Bible just, the truth just comes through. It's powerful. It's a living word, able to pierce through all of mankind's defenses. So knowing the word and letting it out, it's what being a testimony is about. So that's the opportunity that we have. And I I hope we see that and embrace that opportunity. It doesn't mean you have to memorize every verse of Scripture. I challenge people to have lists in the front of their Bible, in the flyleaf of their Bible, things that can be helpful, discussion points that come up. You know, where in the Bible does it say that 
how could you show someone that baptism isn't a part of salvation, that it comes after the fact? Well, you have several key references there, and you can set them up. How, how can you defend against the doctrine of good works, keeping the law? Again, you ought to have key references written down and that you have them written in a little bit of a list there at the front of your Bible. It's sort of you know, a topical reference Bible that you're creating for yourself. Um, it's still the Bible. You're just simply putting things at ready access because I don't know about you, but my mind betrays me at times. At times, familiar verses... I can't call to mind exactly as they should be. One of the problems I have is that Spanish creeps in. And so I want to quote them in Spanish. Doesn't really help the average person if they don't speak Spanish, right? Uh, the other thing that happens is you, should just, you have so much going through your mind that you, you confuse yourself sometimes as to how the quote goes and you can't even get the reference right. Um, I mean, I don't usually flub up on John 3.16, but, you know, it can get that serious. So write things down and have them ready. Have, you know, if you are concerned you might not have your Bible with you, cell phones have a really neat feature, a notes feature. I have got so many notes. I've, I actually have some of my sermons in here, the, the outline of the sermon, because... Uh, maybe it's going to be a stormy day wherever I'm going to preach, and I don't want to take a chance in the electricity going out and not being able to see what I'm trying to do. Backlit phone, that's great. You know, you have the opportunity. But I've also found that when I'm witnessing, there I have some information because I don't always have my Bible with me. You ever been caught without your Bible? And you're trying to witness to somebody? How many times have you been caught without your phone? Not so many. We, it's part of those things, you know. It's the kind of thing that you'll turn around and go back home for if you did forget. Your phone? I was, of course, of course. But, you know, even... Right. But it's always helpful if you can give the address or you have the list somewhere. Like I said, that's what I'm really going to, the lists that you can make uh, available to yourself so that you're aware of where you can find key information so that you can share it with someone. Um, and that particularly is true if you have had a conversation that started with someone and it kind of got left because you didn't have the, all the ammunition you needed. <laughs> you didn't quite remember what verse. I'll look that up. Well, then you need to make a note. But let's go on from there. Here's another statement. While Christians are to stay distinct from the world, they must have regular contact with unbelievers so that their words and actions can point them to Christ, so that Christians' words and actions can point the unbeliever to Christ. There are a lot of too many thems, and they're going both directions. But I think we understand what's being said. There has been over the years a misunderstanding of this point. Um, and we've commented on it before that people get the idea that I can't be a friend of the world because James 4.4 4 says, then I'm unfaithful to Christ. Sure, it does say that. But it depends on what you mean by being a friend. Here, this statement allows for the relationship without any, without any idea of contamination. Here's Matthew 5.16. Let your light so shine where? Before others. So that they may see your good works. And give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Where do you do your good works in, according to this verse? Before unbelievers, correct? That's the context. You are to let your light shine by doing good works in front of unbelievers. Not so that they'll see you like the Pharisees. But because this is a natural and normal, a regular, habitual, if you please, expression of your following Christ. This is the way you live. And I think of Daniel. When the law was made, you couldn't pray to anyone other than the king for 30 days. And Scripture says that Daniel did as he had done before. He just kept doing the same thing, and it was noticed, right? Right? Would it have been as effective if Daniel had never developed that habit and all of a sudden, because the law is made, he opens his window and prays toward Jerusalem? Wouldn't have had the same effect. In fact, the law would never have been made in that case. 
The law was made because they said, if we're going to trip up Daniel, there's no other way we can do it than finding something in relationship to his God. That was letting his light shine. They knew his good works, and they tried to make his good works his stumbling block. It didn't work. Well, it sort of worked. He got thrown into the lions. He got a good night of sleep, and the king didn't. The, the, and then the enemies got thrown in, All right. That wasn't Daniel's idea, though. Yeah. Well, Keep that in mind. That was, that was, that was God's idea. Yeah, you let God in charge of those judgments. I, I don't think Daniel was in there grumbling and complaining to the lions that the other people should have been in there, but uh, that's the way it ended up. Uh, but staying distinct while having contact, all right? Here's another statement on that same line. We must not think that we will be polluted by the company of sinners. Hmm. Is that true? It's a true statement as far as it goes. Who can we um, think of that would be a good illustration of not being polluted just simply because they were in the company of sinners? The one who was called the friend of sinners, of course. When Christ was with sinners, he showed them love. He spoke to them about their sin and their need of repentance. In other words, he didn't sugarcoat his message just because he was with the tax collectors and sinners. He didn't say, I'm okay, you're okay. He didn't say, even behind the scenes, I'm not going to bring up the word S-I-N because that's offensive to people. And I'm not going to bring up H-E-L-L because that's old-fashioned and people get upset when you think, they think that the, you're, you're judging them. That is how mega churches are being built today, by not mentioning truth, by deliberately avoiding truth. That's not what Christ did. Christ was very forthright. So... Going along with this then, can you think of some times when Jesus kept company with sinners? I don't like one word that is in the text of the booklet that you're looking at. It's right in the middle of page 35, right before the blank lines. The word is fellowship. I circled that word. I put a question mark beside it because it's not fellowship. Uh, fellowship is what believers have. It is this commonality in, in Christ. So I think that that is a mistake to use that word there. It's not fellowship with sinners that Jesus had. That's why I chose the phrasing that I did. When did Jesus keep company with sinners? There is a qualitative difference here. Okay? Let's discuss when Jesus did this and then discuss the difference. Can you give me some illustrations off the top of your head? When Jesus... Kept company with sinners. Yes, Michelle. Uh, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, he went to his house. Do you think of anyone else he did that with? He was doing it repetitively, yeah. He piled around, around with Judas for three years. <laughs> Matthew's house, Levi, yeah. The Samaritan woman at the well, good. Anyone else? Okay, the Mary that uh, Mary Magdalene, apparently he had cast out seven demons from her. The demoniacs, when he went into the, the tombs where they were, that was deliberate. You know, we could keep adding to this list. All right, but let's just cut it right there for right now. These are some of the ideas of when Jesus kept company with sinners. What's the qualitative difference that I'm getting at when I say there's, that there is a difference between keeping company with sinners and fellowshipping with them? Why am I making that distinction here? Participation in the sin could be a part of it. What else? How else would you say? What, what would you, how would you distinguish the two concepts? Okay. Let our light shine, and he was not tuning down anything that he was or his message. No, it's right there. He, he was calling them to repentance. Joe? He, uh, his company, 
<laughs> okay. The idea that uh, you're in the idea of fellowship is that there is a commonality. There is a shared experience that is the basis of your relationship. I don't think that fellowship in the Christian sense of the term is possible with someone that is not a believer. But unbelievers can't have fellowship the way Scripture talks about fellowship. And a believer certainly cannot have fellowship with an unbeliever. It's an un- unfortunate choice of words is all I'm saying here. I'm not saying that, they, that the people who put this together are teaching a wrong philosophy. I'm just simply saying this is why I'm picking on that word, because words are important, Okay. A Greek term from which we get fellowship is koinonia, and it's that idea of union, idea of coming together. And I have that type of fellowship with believers when I don't even understand their language. I've experienced that on several occasions. And it's an amazing thing to realize that we share a bond. We share a bond that transcends the color of our skin, the language that we're speaking, the country of origin, and so many other things, cultural and other discussions, because we're one in Christ. And it's that oneness in Christ that I think is essential for there to be truly fellowship. So I would say Christ did not have fellowship in these situations except with his own believer, his own uh, disciples, I should say. But he definitely shared the company of these individuals. And all of the time he was doing that, I believe it was you, Aaron, that, that mentioned he wasn't, he wasn't bringing his character down to their level. No one could say that he had become like the publicans and sinners in those interactions. He wasn't sharing in their ungodly speech. He was actually walking in, and it had been one of those situations where the conversation, if it was off color, would have stopped. Because simply a look from Christ, and you know, that would uh, put the kibosh to anything of that nature. Because such was his testimony, such is his reputation as well as testimony. Uh, Reputation goes toward building testimony, obviously. What you are, what people understand you to be is very, very important. So here then is kind of summing up that idea. Jesus did not ignore sinners' sin, but recognized their need, loved them, and offered them salvation. Contrast that for a moment in your minds, please, with the approach of the Pharisees. They also did not ignore the sinner's sin. They also recognized the sinner's need. But did they love them? And did they offer them salvation? No, they despised them and they offered them humiliation. See, there's a difference And I think we need to be aware of this. We all are aware of the fact that if you have traveled abroad, there is the stigma of the ugly American. But do you know there's also the stigma of the ugly Christian? And it it has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It has everything to do with the overbearing, prideful approach of believers toward behavior that they don't like. We have to be very careful how we go about even correcting evil in our day. The tendency is to do it in the flesh. Scripture says the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. And that means that if the wrath of man is expressed by someone pounding on a pulpit and thundering out anathema from a pulpit, it is just as wrong as if they did it standing in a parking lot. Right? Fire and brimstone preaching isn't always godly. Sometimes it can be anything but godly. It can be in the flesh just as much as any gossip's tongue can be. It is to say that we have to be very careful. Why? 
Are we being like Jesus? You notice the sinners that Jesus was hardest on. The religious hypocrites. Religious hypocrites. He was just <laughs> excoriating of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and their ilk. Because they pretended to be something that they were not. And Jesus didn't want to be lumped in with them. Wolves in sheep's clothing, right? Jesus wanted it very clear where truth was and where the line of error began. We need to be careful that we're not the individuals that are more like the Pharisees that are just willing to throw under, throw to the curb everyone who is not measuring up to our standards of holiness. There are standards of holiness. But do you know what our reaction should be to an individual of immoral or uh, even a, a morality that is contrary to Scripture? Uh, LGBTQ, just you know, to throw out some letters. We have to be careful about how we approach that. Why? If they claim to be a believer, there's a big deal, right? They want to claim to be a believer. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, but I, I'm also this. Sorry, Scripture doesn't give you that permission. Uh, so, you know, a person who wants to make that claim needs to be called down for the inconsistency that that represents with Scripture. We're not talking about someone who has a difficulty with a temptation. We're talking about someone who identifies in the public eye as something contrary to Christianity. That would be about as much as to say uh, someone should be believed if they say that they are a Christian blasphemer. The two don't, they don't mesh. You can't make that work. Yes? Sure. Sure. They could be, and because of all of the murkiness and confusion that is in many people's dialect, uh, and when they talk about these things, they can have wrong ideas, but truth, coming back with truth and letting people know what truth is and that God is inflexible where truth is concerned. It, it isn't up for debate. Uh, Christianity is not a democracy. God's laws are not up for debate. He didn't give the ten suggestions, and uh, he also is very clear on what doctrine is and what doctrine is not, and we need to be clear as well. So the statement from that is we need to be with sinners in order to minister to them, and a verse that gets right to the point there, or two verses, Luke 5, verses 31 32, Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is Jesus' explanation as to why he goes to the homes of recognized sinners and has dinner with them. He's not going there to act like a sinner, but to transform sinners into saints. And so... He was perfectly at ease going to these places, knowing that his presence was not going to contaminate him, but it could very well bring them to salvation. So on the next page there, just summing up this, this section, I want to try to finish it up here. Before we came to Christ, we were just like any of the worldlings we see around us. Maybe we didn't do exactly the same sins as some people we could point out, but the point is we we're alienated from God. We were sinners by choice as well as by birth. And it's because of that that we came to the gospel of Jesus Christ and found freedom, found forgiveness. So the balance statement that we were talking about, a balanced walk, I think this is a very good statement. The balance for the Christian is being available and winsome, friendly to the world trying to influence them for Christ, yet at the same time not adopting the thinking and practices of the world. That pretty well sums it up. 
being available and winsome or friendly, approachable, ready to help in a time of need, always with the idea and the thought in our minds to influence them for Christ, to bring them to saving knowledge of Christ. With words, yeah, you know, that's the only thing we got. That's the weapons. And not adopting the thinking and practices of the world. At the end of this section, there is a helpful exercise, which we won't do orally right now. But it says, write down the names of some unbelieving friends that you may have. How can you work out this principle in those relationships? How can we work out, in general terms, these principles of not being corrupted by the world, but being an influence, being available, being winsome. And that's something for us to think about, isn't it? It's a whole lot easier for us to build walls, to insulate and isolate ourselves, than it is for us to think of ways in which we can build a bridge to help someone, to reach out to someone. And I trust that God will encourage us to do that. And as we do that, as God uses that, that we in our times of prayer request talk a little bit about it, give an idea what God's doing and what we're hopeful to see as we try to use these relationships to bring others to Jesus Christ. But there has to be a genuine interest on our part for these people, a genuine love and care for them. It can't be just simply, I'm just waiting for the day when I can chalk up another one. That in the providence of God will happen. And that is the ultimate goal. But it doesn't mean that our relationship is built on a false premise. They should understand what our purpose is. I want you to understand and, and have the same faith in Christ I've got. This is the best thing there is. But at the same time, being patient and letting the Spirit of God bring that about in someone's life, it's not always easy. On your way in, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and cut it at that point for this week. We'll get back to this 